Good morning, students. In this lecture, now we will continue with the gametogenesis. In the second lecture, we will discuss the sex-specific details. On these first pictures, you see here an oocyte. That's the nucleus. This is a drawing, of course. On the surface, we have the zona pellucida. These are here granulosa cells. Right? It's also marked. And this is a true scanning electron microscopic picture of the surface of an oocyte. This is the surface here of the uh, zona pellucida, and there you see the uh, sperm cell penetrating and fertilizing the oocyte. About fertilization we will talk in the uh, coming lecture, not in this one. So last time we discussed the details of the female genital tract, so don't forget, over is the sized site where the follicles mature and the oocyte is released to the uterine tube. It arrives to the uterus. If it's fertilized, then it will be embedded. If not, then it will die off. And if it dies off, then the uterine mucous membrane sheds through the cervix and through the vagina, it will leave the body. We have to know a little bit about the female cycle. Uh, you will learn more about that in detail in physiology and also in histology in the next semester. The female cycle, uh, what uh, we see that from that in the uterine uh, cavity, that is the changes of the uterine mucosa. Uh, this is truly a cycle, like right? it runs around, it's 28 days long in average. But for practical reasons, we cut this cycle and we make of that usually in the book a straight line. And it's not very logical that we start with the menstruation because the menstruation is the end of the story. But since the first day of the menstruation is something which is really well detectable, this is why the traditional uh, depiction of the cycle is so that in the first five days, we mark the days of the menstruation. So this is when the uterine mucosa sheds and the woman is bleeding, kind of. Thereafter comes a phase through which the mucous membrane regenerates. That's until day 14. On day 14, the ovulation happens in the ovary. Right? And from the follicle, then the yellow body will form, which will produce progesterone. And this progesterone will modify the uterine mucous membrane and it will turn into a so-called secretory uh, mucosa. And the secretory mucosa will stay in the uterus, keeps on growing in case of fertilization and pregnancy. And it keeps on growing for a while, but it realizes that there is no fertilized oocyte. And then it will shed again at the end. But this is already, the uh, we are, with that we are going already to the first days of the next cycle. Right? So this is here the cycle, the typical uh, Marking of the cycle is that from day one to five, that's the menstruation. From day five until 14, that's the proliferation of the uterine mucosa. And thereafter comes the secretional phase until the end of the cycle. Now, how does the oogenesis happen? Now I will tell you a sentence, what you will not understand. But now I don't have time to explain all the words. Slowly, in the following lectures, you will understand all the words in this sentence. So the germ cells migrate to the gonadal ridges on the sixth week from the wall of the yolk sac along the allantois through the dorsal mesentery. This is here the yolk sac. Here you have these germ cells. This is the allantois. And the, these uh, germ cells, they migrate to this territory of the body of the growing embryo on the sixth week. And here they differentiate to ogonia. They do serial mitosis a large series of serial mitosis, and they reach a maximum number of 7 million about in the fifth fetal month. Now you could think about that. Is 7 million a lot or it's not a lot? It looks to be a lot, but if you think about that, that uh, in a small amount of, of blood, one microliter, you have 5 million red blood cells, then it's already understandable that 7 million is not a lot. But this is the maximum number of, of ogonia what exists in the life of a female, in the entire life of a female. From here on, these cells will start a fast apoptosis. And at the time of birth, 
there are only one to two million of these cells. And then they further die off. And by the time of the puberty, the number of these cells is between 40,000 and 400,000. Uh, the newer books, they write rather 40,000 than 400,000. So this is already not a lot. And from this, slowly yet, until the woman will get married and would like to have a child, furthermore will die off. Right? And only a few will reach uh, the full maturation and will ovulate, and only a, a very few have the chance to get ovulated. If a woman has 10 children or sometimes 20 children, that's extremely rare. That's already a lot. But that means that only those egg cells uh, got their, their, their original aim, that they were ovulated and also fertilized. Usually, women have, have less children than 20. You know that from your everyday practice. OK, so this is then this decrease of the cells, which has a great importance in planning your future life. We know that fertility is a big problem all around the world. Women have a tendency uh, to go first to school, which is a very good thing, uh, that, and they, uh, they start a career. But with this, uh, they uh, some kind of jump through the years when they are most fertile. Uh, how to generate germ cells? That's a scientific question. And nowadays, uh, it, uh, there are lots of experiments because lack of, of germ cells, of ogonia, of primordial follicles, is a problem, one, one side of the problem of the fertility. And if it would be solved, how to generate uh, uh, cells like this later on in the life, maybe from, uh, from uh, pluripotent stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, that could solve the problem for some uh, women. So you can read this short uh, uh, abstract of an article here. But another aspect is that if we examine uh, healthy women at different ages, here you see the years, Right? And then you see that uh, the chance to get pregnant in a cycle, it's around 35% uh, until the age 35. That means that if a woman uh, would like to have a baby, uh, then generally within three months she will get pregnant. Some of them will get pregnant in the first month, some of them will get pregnant in the sixth month. But usually they get pregnant uh, within three months. But you see this decline after year 35, the quality of these, uh, these oocytes within these primordial follicles is already not that good, and the fertility it decreases very, very fast, and at the age, for around that age 45, it decreases to zero. However, you know that nowadays uh, in vitro fertilization is very frequent, and if you take women, who are uh, 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 trying to have baby through in vitro fertilization, and they use their own egg cell, then you see about the same decline after age 35, and it reaches zero around age 46. Uh, but if donor egg cells are used for a, from a younger woman, then it stays on the same level. So that means that the body of the woman, the uterus itself, is able to carry a baby if it has uh, external hormonal influence and the secretory phase is built up, just she doesn't have her own egg cells to get fertilized. But donor egg cells may be used, and that's when you re read in the tabloids that 75-year-old Indian woman from India uh, got a baby and they are very happy with their baby. Well, nature cares about uh, these, these babies with that, that very old women normally cannot get pregnant. And it's not very fortunate if she cannot raise her child. Okay, so how does this oogenesis happen? So here you see those ogonia which migrated to the genital ridges and they did the mitotic divisions. But already in the fifth fetal month, these cells, they start their first meiotic division. Uh, they start, but they do not go through. They will uh, be stopped in meiosis I, in the so-called diplotein stage, that's at the end of the prophase, through a factor which is called meiosis inhibiting factor, MIF. 
So this factor, this will stop this first meiotic division in the fetal life and these cells will remain in this state until later in life, some at one point after puberty, at one point somewhere between puberty and the climax, uh, then they go on with this first meiotic division. So that means that some of these cells may stay in this diplotene stage for 45 years, a few of them. Most of them, they continue their meiotic division earlier, many of them die off uh, through this process, and a few of them will get ovulated. Okay, so then we have this primary oocyte. This, uh, this primary oocyte, which started the first meiotic division, has 46 chromosomes. Each is a double-stranded chromosome, so we mark it traditionally with this 4N. This line represents here the birth, and this distance here between the two lines, that represents that period which is between this stop in the fetal life and the continuation which, as I told you, may happen at age 13, or 25, or 36, or 44. Right, so then it goes on, and this uh, further development happens within the follicle. So there you see the typical follicular uh, schematic drawings, the primordial follicle, the starting stage that has a flat epithelial layer around it, then also the oocyte will slightly grow, and this epithelial uh, lining will change into a cuboidal, then it grows, more layers, grows even larger, we'll have a cavity, uh, these cells which grow here, these are here the granulosa cells, and this structure is uh, the, follic uh, the follicle. Uh, within the follicle, there is this cumulus ophorus, and in the cumulus ophorus, there we have the X cell. This, this X cell, as I told you, when the follicular growth starts, is in this stopped stage at the end of the diplotene phase, but it continues its first meiotic division and it finishes it shortly before the ovulation. Through that we get a secondary oocyte. This division is an asymmetrical division. One cell takes most of the cytoplasm and the other cell is a small cell, we call it the polocyte. The genetic content of this small cell is the same, but it doesn't have a cytoplasm. So this is here the secondary oocyte, which is already a haploid cell, which because it has 23 chromosomes, but each chromosome has two strands, two chromatids. Right? Now, uh, the second meiotic division happens only in that case if this X cell is fertilized. So if you think about it, then uh, we talk about these meiotic divisions in the woman, but only those X cells did went through the second meiotic division, which were fertilized. The others never. So as many children a woman has, or as many times she was fertilized, as many times she had only a second meiotic division. Right? So here comes the sperm cell. Sperm cell fertilizes, and if the sperm cell fertilizes uh, this secondary oocyte, then the second, uh, second meiotic division will be finished and we get the mature oocyte, which is already fertilized. Uh, through the second meiotic division also, the division is asymmetric from that aspect that one cell takes most of the cytoplasm. We get again a polocyte, and the first polocyte sometimes divides, sometimes not. So that means that we, get, we end up with two or three uh, polocyte, polocytes. Uh, this whole process from this primordial follicle until the ovulation that lasts six to seven months. Don't believe those books where it suggests that it happens in 14 days. Never. It doesn't happen in 14 days. It takes six to seven months. I have to tell you that even nowadays there are, there are many, many uh, drawings, uh, graphs, uh, where you can see the suggestion that this happens in two weeks. All those are bad. If we didn't know that uh, it, it lasts for, uh, for six to seven months, we could never use the technique of in vitro fertilization. So this has been known for more than 40 years, at least for more than 40 years, that how this truly happens. But for some reason, the books uh, didn't accept this knowledge, the basic histology books and embryology books. So many times we see uh, drawings which are not correct from this point of view. 
Okay, so this cell, the mature oocyte, after the, the extrusion of the second polocyte, uh, it has 23 chromosomes, 22 somatic chromosomes, and one sex chromosome, which is an X. But as I told you, this is already fertilized. So for this, I have here these two, draw two drawings, because actually the fertilization happens in that state when the second meiotic division is already started, and there is this, uh, uh, this division spindle here, Right? And this division spindle will go through only upon the fertilization. Right? Here I drew only two polocytes because, as I told you, the first will either divide or not. And then two pronuclei will form, a female and a male pronucleus, each with 23 chromosomes. They, didn't, they do not unite. About this we will talk yet with the fertilization. So this is a fertilized egg cell here already with the genetic material of the sperm cell. Now, just a little bit about the follicular growth. Uh, we have these names, but in detail we will learn it as in the second semester, that this is here the primordial follicle, this is the primary, and then we have the secondary and graphian follicle. It's uh, maybe better if you call it pre-antral and antral, right? Because if it has already a cavity, then we call it the antral follicle. And uh, this late antral follicle, uh, the graphian follicle, which is ready to ovulate, the diameter of that, that is 15 to 20 millimeters. That's about the size of a cherry. Within this uh, graphian follicle, there is a little ball of cells that we call the cumulus ophorus. And within the cumulus ophorus, we have also here granulosa cells. These are also granulosa cells. And the innermost layer of the granulosa cells, this, is, this forms here the so-called corona radiata. Meanwhile, through the development of this follicle, also the oocyte changes, it grows, the diameter grows to 150 to 200 micrometers, right? This is micrometer. And on the surface, there is the zona pellucida, which is a glycoprotein layer. This corona radiata has an important role because from the surface, from the surface of the oocytes, there are little protrusions. And also the innermost layer of these granulosa cells, the corona radiata cells, they have also little processes. These uh, uh, bridge over the zona pellucida, they contact to each other with gap junctions, and through these connections, uh, the nutrients are provided for the growing oocyte. Okay, so there you see it in the ovary. So from this primordial follicle, through these stages, the primary follicle, the preantral follicle, small antral, large antral follicle, graphian follicle, to the ovulation, that's about six to seven months. This cumulus ophorus, uh, first it's widely connected to the uh, wall of the follicle, later this neck part will be always narrower and narrower, and just before the ovulation, this will, be, this will break through, and the cumulus ophorus, so the axel, the, the uh, the uh, zona pellucida, the corona radiata, and a few uh, other granulosa cells, they swim freely in the antral fluid. This is the point when, through in vitro fertilization, these egg cells are col uh, collected. So the, the doctors, they have to wait for the moment when this is already here released and freely swims around in the antral fluid, but is not yet ovulated, because if it's ovulated, then it will be lost in the peritoneal cavity, never found again. So after the ovulation happens, the cells which remain in the ovary will form the yellow body, which produces progesterone, and will change the uterine mucosa to secretory mucosa, which will allow the implantation. Now again, there is the line for the, for the uh, cycle, and only the last 20 days of the of the growth, of this follicular growth, is under the control of the pituitary hormones, like LH and FSH, uh, mainly FSH first. So the FSH, the follicular stimulating hormone, stimulates the follicle, as the name says, and the LH surge will induce the ovulation, right? So from the six to seven months, these pituitary hormones, they play only a role in the last 20 days but even these 20 days is longer than the uh, 14 days, what is suggested by many books. So don't forget that the follicular growth is six to seven months until the ovulation. 
Okay. And uh, about the size of the follicle, I didn't talk yet about this. So the primordial follicles, those are around 30 micrometer. This is a normal cell size. Uh, then within 120 days, that's four months, it grows to 100 micrometer, has some granulosa cells around it. In the next two months, it grows to one millimeter. And in the last 20 days, it will grow from, 15, from, uh, from this one millimeter to 15, 20 millimeters. That's the size of the cherry. Right? And that, this phase, this last phase, is under the hormonal control. Uh, this is a sketch about uh, the fertilization, where you see here the excel, which is just in, the, uh, uh, in that phase of the second meiotic division that it formed this uh, meiotic spindle, right? Uh, only uh, a part of the chromosome, so one, chromat uh, one chromatid, two chromatid, so the only the two chromosomes are shown here. Uh, here you see also the polocyte dividing. And uh, you see here the zona pellucida, there are these processes which connect to each other, but I told you that it feeds the, uh, the oocyte. And actually, I just realized a few days ago that uh, the drawing is not exactly correct because it here it shows that the entire sperm cell entered the cytoplasm, and that's not true because only the material from the head will enter uh, the cytoplasm of the oocyte. But otherwise, it's a nice... Uh, drawing. And this is a true microscopic picture where you see the excel. This is a fertilized excel, fertilized excel with two uh, pronuclei. Here is the polocyte, and that's here the zona pellucida, these tiny little things here. These are the sperm cells which didn't make through the uh, zona pellucida. Okay, so now what about the male part of the gametogenesis? Uh, we discussed that the, the gametes are formed in the testes, then they go to the epididymis, from there to the different duct, and then the ejaculatory duct connects to the urethra, and through the urethra they may get out. But now we will talk about the formation of the spermatozoa. The start is the same. So the primordial germ cells from the wall of the yolk sac migrate to the genital ridges, they do an initial differentiation, but they, then they remain silent. They remain silent until the puberty. Yeah? At the time of the puberty, uh, the canaliculi of the testes get the lumen, so until then it's, uh, it's closed, then it gets canalized, and these so-called spermatogonia start the mitotic division. Uh, when they do the mitotic division, a part of the cells uh, remains as uh, remain as stem cells, and they will do further mitotic divisions. Another group of the cells will turn into primary spermatocytes. These primary spermatocytes, uh, they contain 46 chromosomes with two chromatids each. That's 46, 4N. This is a primary spermatocyte. You see that when these cells divided here, they did not fully separate from each other. They are connected to each other with cytoplasmic bridges. This is an important point. Uh, the first meiotic, through the first meiotic division, please remember that we have the tetrades, so the homologous chromosomes, each with two chromatids, they uh, get in contact with each other, crossing over happens, chiasma formation, etc. And then the, when the, second, the first meiotic division ends, that, uh, then we get the secondary spermatocyte with tw uh, 23 chromosomes and two chromatids in each chromosome. This first meiotic division lasts for about three weeks, about 20, 21 days. The second meiotic division is much shorter. Right? Then in this case, uh, the, uh, the two chromatids of these 23 chromosomes, they separate from each other, and we get the spermatids. Here, are the, here you see the spermatids. Uh, they contain 23 single-stranded chromosomes, 22 somatic chromosomes, and one sex chromosome. But because the pair of the sex chromosomes is asymmetrical in male, either they will contain X or Y. So it depends on the sperm cell whether the fertilized egg cell will develop in a male or into a female uh, baby. Uh, and you also may observe that these cytoplasmic connections are still here. 
Right now we have our spermatids. These spermatids are already small cells containing the final amount of DNA, but they are not uh, sperm cells yet. From the spermatid, they have to turn into spermatozoa or sperm cells or spermium, so there are more names for that. And this process is called uh, the spermiogenesis. So this is here the spermiogenesis, then they grow their tail, compact their head, and they separate from each other because the cytoplasmic bridges are still here. Right? Why, are, why do we has, have these cytoplasmic bridges? Well, I could compare it to the injection molding. You know that small pieces of plastic particles are often made so that on a stem and then you break them off. Uh, so it's kind of like similar in the case of the sperm cells. They are small things, so they are connected until this final uh, stage. And the entire process that lasts for three weeks, because the second meiotic division is very short, plus two months, because the spermiogenesis, so the, the, the road from spermatid to sperm cell, that's an additional two months. Uh, you have to know this, that then altogether this is about three months. So if a male has any kind of a problem which affects the, this uh, sperm production uh, and it destroys the, the actual set of sperm cells and developing sperm cells at a, t at a certain time point, but it's reversible because the spermatogonia were not uh, destroyed, uh, then it needs about three months to have a regeneration and be fertile again. Okay, this is an extra little information that our ancestors, it, uh, well, we are always interested that where we did come from. And uh, it, it, we are, as, as the molecular biology develops, it turns out that, that mankind started to develop much, much earlier than we thought before. Earlier we thought about 50,000, 100,000 years, but now it comes out in the last decade uh, that uh, our, uh, the male ancestor that was uh, more than 300,000 uh, years ago based on the uh, Y chromosome and uh, the uh, Eve uh, that was also more than 200, 250,000 years uh, ago, or this Eve lived more than 200, uh, 250,000 years ago based on the mitochondrial DNA. So we have lived on the Earth for quite a long time, and we hope that we live yet long, and we will have the chance to pass on our genes to the further generations. Now, uh, now come the details. This is already something that you must know. The details of the spermiogenesis. So the spermiogenesis is the uh, development of the spermatozoa from the spermatid. As I told you, it lasts for about two months. It happens in the testis, in the so-called seminiferous tubules of the testis. And an additional cell type is needed, which is uh, here, these, which are here, these pink cells. Right? These are the Sertoli cells. The Sertoli cells, uh, on, on the side of the Sertoli cells, there are kind of indentations, and there the uh, ogonia and the primary and the secondary spermatocytes develop. Uh, when the spermatids are formed, the spermatids will be embedded into the cytoplasm of the Sertoli cells. Uh, they start their change. At the end, they will develop the head and the tail, and then kind of like they are spit out from the Sertoli cells, and they are uh, washed out from the, uh, from the, uh, the seminiferous tubules uh, with a, a fairly large amount of fluid of the testes. This fluid will be resorbed uh, then later in the epididymis through those stereocilia, what you learned about in the histology on about the third week of your studies. Uh, also, you have to uh, observe here that we have a so-called blood testis barrier. Right? So here, these processes of the Sertoli cells, they reach each other, they have junctional complexes, and completely separate this basal and this luminar compartment from each other. Why is this needed? Because those cells which are on the other side of this barrier, these have already changed their genetic material, they went through the, uh, the conjugation and gene exchange. Now what happens uh, with, the, uh, with the spermatid? First of all, the nucleus will be condensated, so it will be more and more condensated. From the Golgi, Golgi body, 
the uh, acrosome will develop, and the acrosome is a small package of densely packed molecules of enzymes. This, is, this enzyme is the acrosine. The acrosine will be exposed during the fertilization, and it will dissolve the zona pellucida of the oocyte. At the other end, opposite end of the acrosome, the tail will grow, flagellum or tail will grow. Uh, the main structure within this, uh, this tail is the, uh, this, uh, the microtubules, the axonema, uh, which is the structure of the uh, kinocilia also, so it's mobile. Uh, you see that here yet these cells are connected. The excess cytoplasm is pinched off as a residual body, the heads are still connected, and when it's fully ready, then they will only separate, get separated from each other. Now, what are the parts of the sperm cells? We have a head, that's about, it's like a, a flattened pear, right? It's about five micrometers long and three micrometers wide. Uh, it has a neck, which is an extremely short small part, it's only one micrometer, and it has a tail. The tail has three parts, mid piece, main part, and end piece. Sometimes the books do not use the official nomenclature, and they call this mid piece the neck, but truly the neck is only this one micrometer part of the, uh, of the spermatozoan. And this lasts for two months, as I told you. So in this picture you see an electron microscopic uh, picture of the head, uh, neck, and the uh, mid-piece of, of the tail. And here you see a drawing of the sperm cell. Uh, now this, uh, uh, the head part, as I told you, it's about five by three uh, micrometers, and it contains the, the nucleus and the acrosome. This territory is here the neck, Right? This is about one micrometer. It has a proximal and a distal centriole. And then comes the mid piece uh, of, the, of the tail portion. This is about 15, 20 micrometers. Altogether, the tail that may be between 50 and 80 micrometers. The structure of this, this mid piece is, is that in the middle we have the microtubules, the, the typical kinocilial structure. Around it we have uh, the so-called outer dense fibers. From those we have nine. This is this dark line here. In a longitudinal cut we don't see the profiles of these nine outer dense fibers. And we have a lot of mitochondria. Here these little rings represent the mitochondria. And at the end of this midpiece there is a so-called annulus. After the annulus comes the main piece. In the main piece, in the middle, we have microtubules. We have seven outer dense fibers, and around it we have a fibrous sheath, and then comes the membrane. And in the end piece, we only have the microtubules. In this next picture, you see a cross-section of this main piece. We see here these microtubules of the kinociliar structure, doublets and singlets in the middle. You see the seven outer uh, dense fibers, which are asymmetry divided by this fibrous sheath, like this has here a septum, right? And this asymmetrically divides these outer dense fibers, the compartment of four and the compartment of three, and it's thought that this asymmetry will cause the propelling movement of the sperm tail, which provides that it can go forward and find the oocyte. Uh, about the kinocilia, you must have studied also in histology. This is the, here the same structure, right? And I would like to call your attention that there is a disease which is called Cartagener syndrome. In this case, uh, these D9 arms, which are marked here with these red little lines, the D9 arms are missing. And this is the electron microscopic picture of the, uh, of the uh, of normal kinocilium, where you see here the D9 arms. And if there are no D9 numbs, then, then this is messed up, completely messed up. And, and now you can find out that what symptoms these may, patients may have. Sperm cells will not move, so they have fertility problems. If it's a female, then the oocyte doesn't pass through uh, the uterine tube. And both of them may have problems in the respiratory tract, where the respiratory epithelium needs also the proper movement of the kinocilia. 
this picture is just a nice demonstration of the, this uh, microtubular structure, these radial proteins, the D9 arms, to have a good imagination how this looks like. <coughs> And this is a, a drawing of a sperm cell where you can see all parts, you can follow all parts, that how it, it uh, is designed. And you know that from this point to this point, this may vary from 50 to 80 micrometers, so it's quite a long cell. And, and then the little history. In the Middle Ages, this, this was how uh, the people Imagine that what is inside the sperm cell, it's very cute, a small baby is sitting here with a large head and a greater fonticle here. Uh, this is a scanning electron microscopical picture of sperm cells. And this is a primitive microscope through which in the 17th century, uh, the that time scientists uh, uh, started to, the, uh, to examine the sperm cells. These are scanning electron microscopic pictures where you see here in green color the Sertoli cell, the purple, blue, and purple. These are here the spermatogonia and the spermatocytes, and the yellow one are the sperm cells. In this one here, the sperm cells are red, and you see here gaps between the uh, Sertoli cells. This is artifact due to the shrinkage of the tissue during the preparation. But otherwise, it gives you a good imagination how they are arranged in the uh, seminiferous tubules. Now, the, <clears throat> the, if uh, less than 10% of the spermatozoa are abnormal, that doesn't affect uh, the fertility, if otherwise the number of sperm cells is enough. What may be this abnormal shape? This is uh, when I talk now about abnormal human spermatozoa, then I, I, I don't think about the genetics, I think about the shape of the uh, spermatozoa that the size of the head may vary, the length of the tail, it may have two heads, it may, may have two uh, more tails, so there are all kinds of variations. These, so to say, don't play with the fertilization. So the fertilization needs a healthy, good sperm cell, and a few hundred sperm cells from the, uh, from the about uh, 50 to 100 million uh, reach the site of the fertilization, and the best one will only fertilize the egg cell. Uh, I advise you to go to the YouTube with these links or find other links uh, to have an impression how the sperm cells are moving. Uh, Lou van Hoek, I already mentioned it in the, in the first introductory histology lecture. He was a very curious merchant. He also examined uh, the sperm, and you know that the sperm is the entire fluid, 5% of which are the uh, sperm cells, and he described what he saw, greater quantity of living animalcules, that I am much astonished by it, in a bit of matter no longer than a grain of sand, more than 50,000 animalcules, shaped like river eel, uh, move about with uncommon vigor. So this is what you would see also if you find a nice video for it. Uh, and I also told in, this, on that, in that first introductory lecture that in the 17th century, in many places of the world, they started to do microscopic examination. There was also a doctor in Hungary who started to do similar investigations. Uh, this was the microscope of Lovenhoek, and you may read here what he found. Uh, well, uh, until he discovered that, uh, that flies, they also come from tiny little eggs and they have to hatch and uh, they turn into flies through more steps. Uh, the, uh, people thought that there is the so-called apiogenesis. Uh, life comes from mud, decay or rotting material. So we know today, today for us it's so very obvious that it doesn't come from mud and decay. Uh, at that time they only saw that if they had a rotting piece of meat, then on that rotting piece of meat at one point worm, worms appeared. Right? And this is why they thought that it comes from the rotting material. They didn't see the microscopic eggs of these bugs which, uh, which then developed to worms. And now we will compare the differences between spermatogenesis and oogenesis. Uh, the first thing is that the spermatogonia start to divide truly at puberty. Right? And the division of the ogonia that ends before birth in the fifth fetal month with a maximum of 7 million. 
from one spermatogonium, four equal spermatozoa are produced. And from one oocyte, uh, from one ogonium, one mature oocyte, and two or three polocytes uh, will form. The sex chromosome in the sperm cell, that may be X or Y, and in the oocyte, it may be only X. So the sperm cell decides whether it will be a male or a female. The spermatids after the second meiotic division have to go yet through the spermiogenesis, which is an additional two months, this, uh, this change from spermatid to spermatozoa. On the contrary, in the female, the, the mature oocyte exists only after fertilization. Right? We need uh, the, uh, the fer fertilized, the, we need the fertilization in order to let the second meiotic division run through. In male, theoretically, the sperm production and sperm cell production is continuous after puberty. In female, it is cycling, cyclic from uh, puberty until menopause, and thereafter there are no uh, primordial follicles which could develop to follicles and induce then ovulation. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>